So staying with fatty acids, I wanted to cover the naming conventions that you'll encounter in scientific literature as well as textbooks. Here you can see I've listed the same fatty acid but used three different naming conventions for them. So this is the scientific or the shorthand notation uh, where you have numbers representing the number of carbons in the chain and the number of double bonds present in the chain. So in this particular case palmitic acid can be represented as 16-0 but its IUPAC name is actually hexadecanoic acid. So all three of these names are, tend to be used interchangeably in literature and various publications around lipids. And so the rest of this table just illustrates this for you. Another example being oleic acid. It's a monounsaturated fatty acid. 18 carbons so its notation is 18-1. Oleic acid is its common name, but its IUPAC name is cis-9 octadecanoic acid. And then you can see this trend continues. You get some confusion surrounding fatty acids which contain the same number of double bonds and the same number of carbons, however different arrangement of double bonds. And a good example of this is linolenic acid. You can have either 18,3N3, which refers to an omega-3 fatty acid, or you can have 18,3N6, which refers to an omega-6 fatty acid. Under the common names, you would refer to these as alpha-linolenic acid and gamma-linolenic acid. Um, and their IUPAC name, the only designation that differs is the numbering of the double bonds, the position of the double bonds, where you have all cis 9, 12, 10, or sorry, 9, 12, 15, octa, Dectatrinoic acid versus all cis 9, 6, 9, 12 octadecatrinoic acid. So the naming conventions are as follows. You have your common name, and in this case we're going to use oleic acid as the example. So the common name being oleic acid. You can see it here. The Geneva system, or the IUPAC system, is the chemical or the proper chemistry name for the particular fatty acid you're referring to. And in this case, for oleic acid, it's 9 octadecanoic acid. And here you can see what each of the what each portion of that name refers to. Then you have the delta or the omega system of naming the double bond structures. Okay, so the double bond, when it is present uh, at a particular carbon, which is counted from the carboxylic end of the fatty acid, with the carboxylic acid carbon being carbon one, you have delta 9 or 18 1 or 18 1 semicolon 9. So these are the, the, the naming structures or conventions which fall under the delta naming system. But then there's the omega naming system and in this case it's when you name the double bond position from the methyl end and in this case you refer to the double bond as an omega in this case 9 or C18 1. Okay, So you can see there are similarities and differences and in the case of oleic acid, it's not an issue because no matter which end of the carbon, which end of the carbon chain you count from, the double bond appears at carbon nine. However, the example I'm going to give you next is for linoleic acid, which is 18,2. So if we follow the delta naming system for, for linoleic acid, you get 18,2 delta nine 12, and if you follow the omega, you get 18,2 omega six. So whether you count from the methyl end or the carboxylic acid end, in this particular case you'll get two different names for the same fatty acid. The omega-6, uh, the, the omega system, counting from the methyl end, you've got carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So you have an omega-6 or an N6 fatty acid. Then your next fatty acid is omega-9 because you continue counting 7, 8, 9. So you have an omega-6 fatty acid but it also has a second double bond at omega-9 or N9. However, if you're counting from the carboxylic end, you end up with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, nine as your first double bond encountered. And then continuing in the counting system, you would have carbon 10, 11, and then 12. And so you can see, 
depending on which end and which type of naming you are using, you would produce two different uh, names for the same fatty acid. Something else we should mention about fatty acids uh, is that we don't tend to eat fatty acids in our diet um, in as individual fatty acids. We get fat in our diet in the form of triglycerides. And these triglycerides are found in both animal and vegetable fats. Now, an as a, this goes back to the, to the chemistry aspect of um, triglycerides and fats in our diet when I was mentioning that the order and the arrangement of the fatty acids on the triglyceride has um, can take any shape or form uh, where you can have varying chain lengths and varying degrees of unsaturation. And so because of that, when you are looking at fatty acids profiles of particular fats, they are not usually going to be uniform and you're going to have a great degree of variability in the type of fatty acids you're consuming despite consuming the same amount of fat. So d depending on the oil source, the fatty acid distribution is going to vary greatly. And here are some good examples of that. If you see here in this table, um, let's take for example um, canola oil or rapeseed oil. So canola has a low degree of saturation. You can see here red is designated as saturated fatty acids. Blue is poly. Uh, alpha linoleic, linolenic sorry, is identified as orange, which is also part of the PUFA, but this is identifying the presence of omega-3 fatty acids. And then the yellow refers to monounsaturated fatty acids. And here you can see that 61% of canola oil is made up of um, oleic acid, a monounsaturated fatty acid. Now, if you move down and look at soybean oil, also a very popular and commonly and highly consumed fatty acid, you'll see that in this particular case, 54% is um, linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. So you can see the distribution of two vegetable oils, which are highly consumed in our diets, are very distinct and very different. Then if you look at some of the animal fats, uh, such as lard, or butter, you can see the saturated fatty acid content is much higher, 68% in the case of butter, 43% in the case of lard, uh, and the uh, PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acid content is very low. So this is a point that you should consider uh, when assessing dietary fat intake in that the amount of fat consumed does not necessarily necessarily give you any indication of the fatty acid profile of the fat that's been consumed by an individual and without knowing this you cannot really make a determination on the healthiness or unhealthiness of an individual's fat consumption. Now a separate note on omega-3 fatty acids, we have two different types of omega-3 fatty acids. We have um, those from plant sources and those from animal sources, primarily fish. Um, the long chain polyunsaturated omega-3s in fish are we know are EPA and DHA. And the most common plant-based omega-3 fatty acid is alpha linolenic acid. They are very different and come in very different parts of our diet. Therefore, consuming one does not necessarily mean you are sufficient in all omega-3 fatty acids. And they're of nutritional importance because we have several um, well-respected scientific bodies who have made general health uh, position statements regarding the health effects of omega-3 fatty acids. So this is an example of the American Heart Association statement where they say it reduces the susceptibility to the heart uh, of a ventricular arrhythmia. They are antithrombotic and hyper hypo sorry triglyceridemic. They retard the growth of atherosclerotic plaques. They reduce adhesion molecule expression, and they also reduce platelet-derived growth factor. They are anti-inflammatory. They promote nitric oxide-induced endothelial relaxation, and they can be mildly hypotensive. So generally, what all this means is that the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids will help prevent clotting of your blood, reduce your risks of stroke, help reduce your triglycerides, However, what these statements don't clarify is that the source at which you get your omega-3 fatty acid has to be varied. So you need both the fatty acid, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids from cold water fish, which are EPA and DHA, while also getting adequate amounts of alpha linoleic acid, which is present in vegetable oils, highly present in uh, vegetable oils such as flaxseed oil. So just by way of a summary, I want to just highlight the main points of this, this study where they assess the phospholipid fatty acid composition from both the 
Greenland Inuit and mainland Danes, the platelet phospholipids of the Greenland Inuit distributed in the following manner. So these are unitless, but this will give you an idea of proportion of these particular fatty acids found in these phospholipids. And you see that the arachidonic acid, which is an N6 fatty acid, and then the N3 fatty acids, or omega-3 fatty acids, distributed relatively equally. It was basically one to one to one. Versus the Western diet uh, consuming Danes who have much higher N6 or omega-6 fatty acid presence in the phospholipids of their platelets and very little EPA and DHA. Now the functional consequence of this is related to clotting time. If you don't know what I'm referring to, this is the time it requires for a drop of your blood to clot. And in this study they use clotting time as a function of platelet activity and associated this clotting time with the risk of heart attack and stroke in both populations. This very early study assessing the dietary intakes uh, of Greenland Inuit versus mainland Danes and the effect that omega-3 fatty acids have on their incidence of heart attack and stroke was very informative in terms of showing this in uh, free-living individuals that their diet can significantly impact their risk of heart attack and stroke. So again, this is back to this chart just to drive home the point that understanding the fatty acid composition of a dietary fat is just as important as measuring the total quantity of dietary fat that's consumed. So that concludes part one and in part two I'll be covering the digestion and absorption of dietary fats.